So, uh, once again, uh, hello everyone and thank you for participating in this webinar offered by the European School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's platform uh, for school education in Europe. My name is Maria Lena and uh, I will be moderating today's webinar. Uh, so, a uh, few reminders. Uh, please uh, feel free to use the chat to post uh, any thoughts or questions during the webinar and our speaker will uh, reply to any questions towards the end of the webinar. Uh, please also uh, make sure that you will uh, fill in the final survey form. Uh, we will serve with you towards uh, the end of this meeting. As mentioned, uh, the webinar is being recorded. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to share them in the chat. Uh, so uh, for this webinar, we have invited Professor uh, Matthew Montevello. Uh, professor Montevello is a full professor uh, and the head of Department of Artificial Intelligence uh, at the Faculty of ICT at the University of Malta. Uh, he, has uh, he has an extensive experience, uh, teaching experience, along uh, with uh, multiple degrees, uh, some of them on the field of computer science, education, uh, e-learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, today, uh, with uh, Professor Montebello, we will explore uh, how artificial intelligence and, art and AI tools uh, can uh, revolutionize various aspects of educational uh, leadership uh, from from creating a more personalized learning paths to efficient administrative management, including, including data-driven decision-making or protecting important information and considering all those important ethical information we cannot share. So, with no further delays, Professor Montebello, the floor is yours. You can uh, start sharing your screen. Excellent. Thank you, Marilena. Um, I, I was having a look at the chat. Um, I can see that actually there are some local people from, from Malta as well, like Daniela, Melanie, and others. Um, and if anybody in the chat is saying that they cannot hear, there, there must be there might be something wrong with, with your with your audio um, because we did the test and it seems to be working. Right, Marilena? Uh, yes, uh, now things work, but I see you're freezing a bit. Your image is freezing a bit now. I don't know if it's from my side or your, but let's hope this will be solved. Okay, no worries. Yes, um, yes but we can hear you. Yes, okay. So I'm just moving the slide to show you that I'm still alive. Okay, so today's today's session, which is going to be an hour, is was chosen as title, Empowering Education Leadership and um, educators through AI. As Marilena said, I'm um, an academic at the University of Malta. I head the AI department, but specifically I focus on the use of AI or the application of AI to education for a very simple reason. Um, I started my career as an educator. I was teaching in, in, in secondary schools around Malta, teaching computer science, mathematics, and eventually I, I specialize in the in, in the area of computer science. And some years later, I, I started applying computer science to education. So I um, pursued a doctorate in education as well, uh, specifically in e-learning and combined the two areas and, you know, um, which are my two favorite areas into my main research area. Uh, and, and that's what, what, I, what I'm doing now, obviously with, AI taking off so strongly in the last 15 to 20 years, but very strong in the last five years. And now in the last year, 18 months with generative AI, obviously it's becoming pervasive all over wherever you look in, in, in whichever domain. But obviously education is one of the most important areas. So I'm glad that I could combine the two areas together. For today's session, as you can see in my outline, I'll be doing the introduction, which I just did. Um, and uh, then I'll be going into th these three important parts, approximately giving 15 to 20 minutes each. But definitely, I would like to explain and help you understand how AI, what AI is initially and how it can be applied in education. Eventually, the most important part, the central part, is the second part, which is the empowerment part and how will AI empower educators and ed ed education policymakers. 
Um, and finally, um, I would like to talk about the very important topic, which Marilena mentioned as well, which are not just challenges, but the ethical considerations of AI, because they are part and parcel of AI. It's part of the success of AI and how good this will become in the future. As you can see, in the, even in the, in the graphics I chose, actually the first graphic I generated through AI. I couldn't find the graphic I liked, I liked online, so I generated one using um, a generative AI large language model to create um, this diagram. Similar to, to the, the first diagram as well, this first diagram, I asked the generative AI, asking it, what does empowering education leadership through AI look like in a visual? And it gave me this visual, which I liked. Um, talking about um, understanding AI in education, and the main thing is that AI is not meant to replace educators, as you can see on the board, but to empower them. So I wanted um, uh, an educator within a class with students with a obviously powerful presence of technology right behind her, um, which, which obviously signifies the, the merging of education and technology, empowering the educator uh, within the class, which as it should be. The second part, the empowerment of educators and how AI will empower us. I found this nice quote where it says, you know, AI won't replace you, but someone using AI, yes, will definitely will. You know, we used to speak about IT literacy and how much people are IT literate or not, but in the future or right now, it's we assume that everybody is IT literate, um, but the, the, the clue where will be who is AI literate more than IT literate. So if you're not AI literate and you're not figuring out what's happening when you're um, encountering AI in your life, as you can see shortly in the next slide, obviously you will be missing uh, missing out. And the third um, part, the image I, I borrowed off the web, I found this nice image of um, ethical considerations, including privacy, bias, discrimination, surveillance, autonomy, and I would like to talk about this towards the end, and then we'll conclude our session. So yes, right off with the first part, and one slide, I don't want to waste too much time on what AI is per se, because I want to be sure that we're all on the same page, okay? I put in three central definitions, which we usually tell our students, which is the basic AI course. Um, and usually we define AI, first of all, by defining what intelligence is, if you could do that, because it's not easy to define intelligence. But once you define intelligence for a human, um, anything that a machine, typically a computer, computer machine, or a computer system can do what usually requires a human to do, that will be intelligence that is not human, but it is artificial. So there we go, where artificial intelligence comes through. So a first definition, the study of computer systems that attempt to model and apply the intelligence of the human mind. Keeping that in mind, actually that first definition helps us a lot because when we try to, to um, produce or propose models, different ways of how to do AI. There are different ways that um, computer scientists have tried to simulate um, human intelligence. One of them was using the human mind and the synapses and the neurons in our mind. And that's where artificial neural networks happened to be one of them, which is, which is very, very popular. Um, most probably you've heard about neural nets. You've heard about deep learning, which is deep neural net or deep artificial neural net. And this is a model of how we represent artificial intelligence proposed by a computer scientist way down the line. And eventually research kept on going approximately five to eight years ago. Um, somebody else um, proposed uh, deep neural networks, which means a neural net which much, with much more deeper um, hidden layers, and that's why it's called deep um, deep artificial neural nets. And our definition is a branch of computer science dealing with the simulation of intelligent behavior in computers. So literally, we try to figure out what is human intelligence, and then we try to simulate it. For example, somebody recommending a nice movie for you, and that's what, for example, what Netflix does. That's why I have the Netflix over there because it's trying to recommend, since you watch this movie, this movie will be 
ideal for this particular viewer, for example. Um, Amazon does it with Box. Um, Alexa, for example, understands, and, and Siri, understand human language, natural language. So again, there's a slight uh, value of intelligence over there because humans understand natural language. But even self-driven cars like in the Tesla or generating text, um, even being creative, as I showed you with the image, like um, generative AI and chat GPT, which is one of the most popular large language models around. Others like Microsoft Bing and other generative AI, like um, Google Gemini, for example, Perplexity, and other um, generative AI, which obviously in these last months, when I say last months, six to 12 months since November, December 2022, um, generative AI has taken the word by storm, which I'm sure you, 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 you know about, and which I'll be talking about slightly more later as well. So that's um, artificial intelligence for you. Um, I'm going to include a very short activity, which is going to take less than two minutes. So what I want you to do is either scan this QR code with your phone, or else go into the um, this URL on your browser, slido.com, and it will ask you for a code, and you can enter 245045, and it will ask you a question. The question is going to be very simple. When I, when I mention AI, what comes to your mind? Just mention one word. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start it off in a second so that you can And if you follow, if you follow the, the code I gave you, which I'm going to put up online again, you can, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, it should be this one. No, it's not this one. It's this one. Okay. So people have started entering. So there is the, um, the link. The code you can and you start entering and you can see um, on your screen as well in real time for participants are typing keep on typing i can see that there are a lot of participants which i'm very glad 128 participants most probably i'm one of the 128 as well but it's good to see so when i say ai at the moment what comes to mind, plenty of people are saying chat GPT. OK, we'll wait a couple of more minutes to see what's happening. Some people are entering future. I see artificial world. I see pineapple. <laughs> Sora, maybe they meant Siri. I don't know. The future is the present innovation, change, power, renaissance. Chat GPT still is strong. By the way, this is called um, a word cloud and the most popular term entered is in a bigger font. Somebody put intelligent computer machines, deep learning, fantastic. Somebody wrote ChatGPT as a whole word and actually slightly smaller. At the moment, we have a, a tie future and ChatGPT, and that gives us an idea of what people are thinking. And it's true, it's true. Plenty of people, as soon as you mention AI nowadays, the first thought is ChatGPT. Actually, I come across people when I'm doing lectures or doing public talks, um, even within other faculties, that they think that AI was started when ChatGPT started, two years ago, basically. And then I tell them, look, our department has been here since 1990. In the 1950s, Alan Turing was talking about the, the initial start of artificial intelligence. He didn't coin the word, but he was the grandfather of artificial intelligence, Alan Turing. So let me see these two participants typing in. Next generation technology, and we'll move on. Web 4.0, information, problem solving. OK, so fine. Um, thank you for that. It's it's um it's a facility. It's it's um actually an app free to use. It's it's Slido, like another one, like Menta is another one, for example. Maybe you've used it before. Um, and it allows us to 
have uh, participants, even if it's in a physical classroom, um, participate in um, during the during the presentation, for example. So thank you for that. We'll have another short activity later on. And um, so you, you don't need to log out of your browser because it will update on its own later on. But right off and talking about artificial intelligence and education. In the slide, I try to put a number of things which we'll re refer to later on. But um, as mentioned earlier, on the right, you can see some textbooks, um, some, some of my own um, that I've written over the years related to AI in education. Um, these are available, and if you would like a copy, just you can email me. I'll send you the email at the very end of the presentation. But basically, the idea is, and we'll come back to this later on, even when we talk about generative AI, is a, of having the student at the center of the learning process. The student, as you see at the top, top left diagram, the student and the student's profile. So we need a, a, a learner profile generation so that we can personalize the learning. This is where AI is so powerful. AI is tracking all the time, whatever user is using a system. It could be people browsing or people watching movies on Netflix or, or people shopping on Amazon and so on and so forth. Whatever you're doing, the system at the back, on the back end is keeping track of what you are doing, of what you're clicking, of how much time you spend in a, on a browser, where, even where, where you're looking at, what you, what, whatever you're doing, you're posting, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a very important thing to keep in mind, especially when you're um, using social media, because the system is keeping track of you for the sole purpose, in the case of social media, usually is either to recommend friends, for example, or more importantly, trying to sell something for advertising, because that's how, how they strive, literally. So, um, Social media make very good use of user profiling. In this case, since we're talking about education, the idea is of profiling the learner. Why? So that I can recommend as a system which best part or educational part this particular student um, needs to take. So if I have two students, somebody is good in mathematics and somebody is good in languages, obviously I recommend to the first student a specific course of action not necessarily has to be mathematics because the student is very good in mathematics, but for the second student who's not got so good in mathematics, how do I know? Because from the uh, portfolio, from the personal profile of the student, mathematics seems to be lacking. I recommend revision notes and so on, so mathematics. So that's what the idea of personalized, personalized learning. But obviously the student is owning the learning. The student himself or herself um, takes ownership of the learning process. The fact that it's anytime, anywhere, and it's obviously based on the competency of the own student is very important. But the fact that it's being customized to the needs of the specific learner gives it a lot of power. At the bottom left is actually a system um, I helped to develop at the University of Illinois, where I'm an adjunct professor as well. Um, in this case, we don't use Moodle or, or, or Blackboard as a, as a virtual learning environment. We use this social network like um, learning environment. As you can see, it's very much customized to every um, learner because it keeps analytics or information or learning analytics about each student. Giving this score, you can see this sort of circle with different petals giving the score for different parts of this course. In the bottom right are another number of um, terms that we use, learner profile generation, a recommendation capability. So when a system recommends, suggests, it's being intelligent. As I said with Netflix, it's recommending um, Amazon, suggesting books. So a system that recommends the best course of action for education is termed artificial intelligence. The fact that I can have a specific piece of software, which we usually call like um, um, a software agent. This is assisting, in fact, it's at the center of this bottom right diagram, a pedagogical assistant around the learner, recommending which books to read, which websites to look at, what to revise in, because the student is particularly weak in a subject more than another, for example. 
So obviously, all this information, together with the bottom one, which is the learning analytics, will create a much personalized, a much customized course of action, educational course of action um, for this particular student. So when we talk about AI in education, um, usually we talk about this profile that is generated for each user. And what's the beauty about it, as the, as the learner is using it over and over again, and as time passes, this profile continues to evolve and refine itself closer and closer to the learner. Because it starts off very generic, but as the learner starts using it over time, it gets very, very much closer to the true learner, um, recommending and suggesting the best course of action um, in this case. As I said, the, these, these books on the right um, are available in PDF. You can ask me for a copy. Um, one of them is talking about this idea of user profiling and some projects that happened um, in the mid 2000, 2015, 2016, the AI injected in learning. And the, sec the third one is about what um, the future of a classroom, which I call an ambient intelligent classroom, which looks like the top right, you know, this, this it's not even a classroom, it's a learning environment where students are roaming around with sensors, with artificial intelligence um, within the walls, keeping track of which students are closer to which monitors, for example, or um, ensuring that students with the same interests can meet and talk. You can see this environment of a future, I say classroom, but it's a, more, than, more than a classroom, it's a learning environment. And I talk about this idea in that third book. The middle book is also um, a book about AI in education. As I said, they're, they're free, so I'm not selling anything. And this, this is something we wrote ourselves at the Department of AI to assist um, educators and teachers um, use AI in their classroom with students. So it's a number of worksheets that they can use. Moving on, I'm going to show you a short video about AI in education. So again, I'm going to stop um, my share and share this video. Okay, here we go. <laughs> In the classroom right now, I'm encouraging students to use AI as a tool within their processes. I think that the greatest human asset is curiosity. Our curiosity is what makes us human. It's our search for knowledge and our search for information. And so what I encourage students to do is to stay curious. But I'm also encouraging them to be critical about how effective it is. And so I think what happens is that what we want students to do, you know, if we talk about critical thinking, for example, what we want students to do is to is to be critical about artificial intelligence and say, how is this making me better? I recently had students create an ad film around a technology that they invented, that they made up. The only rule that I gave them was that they had to use artificial intelligence at some stage or at some stages during their creative process. But then what I did, was I had them analyze how effective it was. Quality of their input was directly related to the quality of the output from AI. Using AI doesn't mean that, that we're not gonna create the next Ernest Hemingway or the next Paulo Coelho using AI, right? It's gonna make all of us better. It's gonna raise the bar. Correct. It's, it's the it's bar. Stop it there and go to raise the bar because this is the, the idea behind this video. We're raising the bar. Raising the bar is meaning raising the level, the, the entire level of the education process. And this is why it's empowering us. Um, having said this, numerous educators, including today I, I had a session with our own academics at the University of Malta, trying to explain how we need to change the way we assess our students because plenty of them are scared about generative AI. How can I give something out when there is AI out there that they can generate the assignment, the essay, the graphic, whatever they're doing, they can generate slides, it can generate code, it can generate tables, graphs, it cannot do all this. How can I do this? 
and ensure that it's their own work. So this is actually a problem that plenty of universities are encountering and plenty of universities are completely in, in the not really knowing what they should do in the next step. So the, idea, the main idea is um, how can we empower educators to use AI to their advantage? So obviously a number of things, as I already mentioned, the fact that we can change the assessment process to really figure out what each student is strong or not so strong about and assess that part is already something that obviously we're customizing even the assessment process. The idea of AI is that it is specific, tailored to the different needs of the of the students. Um, having said that, in this list I'm showing you over here, I didn't want to talk only about educators. I want to talk about leadership as well. So, for example, the second point is ab about automated administrative tasks. And this is a strong thing that AI can do. It can also obviously um, assist us as policymakers. It can assist us as um, heads of schools and leaders on how to ensure our programs are even better and enhance the engagement or increase enrollment, for example, or decrease um, students um, who, who fall off from, from the system. But it can also obviously create a number of insightful data analysis, and even using generative AI, this can be done, to give us information about our students, where they're being strong, where they're coming from, and so on and so forth. So it provides the support for diverse learning needs. So obviously having this idea that AI can also assist in being um, something that it's available for everybody is a very important and something nice about AI for our society. Um, looking at also the idea of having um, virtual teaching assistants, which can be present at any point, at any time of the day. So a student who went home, a student who's in the car, a student who is about to go to sleep and is looking at the task, the virtual assistant, because it's a, it's a piece of software, it could, even be, it could even look like a human or a cartoon or a software, whatever you want it to be, assists um, the student during the, the, the learning process. Obviously, if it is taking care of a specific student and it has all the information, all the learning analytics of this particular student, this virtual assistant can be much more effective. So again, I can show you this diagram on the right. It's creating, it's generating the learner profile for, for a specific student and based on these information at the bottom, the learning analytics, it can recommend and it can obviously um, generate text and other information like um, customized tests and um, customized revision notes for this specific student. This virtual tick assistant will be the pedagogical assistant around, around the learner. And obviously, the final point, we can use AI for professional development um, continuous professional development CPD of the different academics, the different tutors, depending on their needs. Again, um, an academic from our department doesn't need training on generative AI, but all the academics I had this morning, about 40 of them were from different uh, faculties, from the Faculty of Arts, Faculty of Law and Faculty of Medicine, um, who are struggling with the use of generative AI with this disruptive AI coming through the classroom and being lost on what to do next. So important that our professional development, which is available all over the Internet, and obviously it's a matter of finding the right information um, for the right uh, task at hand. A second short video, again, two minutes. I don't want to waste time. Um, this is about generative AI, and um, I'm going to share it with you to give you a quick, a quick idea. So I'm going to stop sharing. It takes me some time to do this and share the second one, which is uh -huh. what is generative AI. So coming up. Here we go. What is generative artificial intelligence or generative AI? Generative AI 
is an artificial intelligence technology that can create new content in text, image, music, and video forms. Businesses are exceptionally excited by the possibilities of specialized generative AI models because they can be trained on an organization's own corporate data. And they can collaborate with knowledge workers to dramatically boost productivity. Estimates value the productivity boost at up to $8 trillion a year to the global economy. An example of generative AI is chatbots, which have taken the world by storm, thanks to their ability to write human-like conversational text. They can express complex ideas synthesized from the vast volumes of information on which they are trained. In business, they can help write or improve emails and presentations, help ideate new marketing campaigns, and much more. Generative AI relies on machine learning models that mimic human neural networks, a concept that dates back to early AI research. Critical algorithms emerged in the 1980s that advanced the science, and in the last few years, new training algorithms. The availability of purpose-built processing units, for example, GPUs which provide massively parallel processing power, and refinements in training datasets. These have all led to the systems that we use today. The result is generative AI models that appear to create surprisingly like humans do. Innovation in generative AI is accelerating at breathtakingly fast speed as businesses all over the world experiment with it, while entrepreneurs and investors launch new business ideas to build upon it. Generative AI has launched a new era in technology that promises both greater productivity and new ways to solve business problems that simply weren't previously possible. So the fact that it's talking about business, e-learning is a massive business to keep in mind as well. So it, it applies to, to any kind of business and the experts are talking about could be the educators, the academics who can obviously contribute to the generative AI itself. Generative AI is becoming one of, is, is becoming in the last years, I'm sure you've heard about it, most probably using some generative AI model like ChatGPT, 3.5 is free or, or the four, which also creates images um, or, Google, or Google Gemini is, is another one. Um, perplexity is one I use because it gives me references. So there are loads of them outside and obviously I encourage you to go out and look at these because it is the next future. Actually, I, I would recommend to the European School of Educa the Education Platform to, to create to obviously the next talk to be about generative AI, especially apl applied to education because it is massive. But as I said, the, the problem that plenty of academics, plenty of universities are, are, are finding is the issue of assessment. And the idea over there and applies to AI in education and applies to um, the application of AI for education leadership as well, is the fact that we need to adapt to the technology. We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to reskill and upskill ourselves and our employees. So as a leader within the um, educational process, your thought process is not how to keep away AI because it's not going to go away um, and banning it is not going to work eventually. So we need to, in my opinion, embrace it as a tool, embrace it as we embrace the calculator in the 1980s because um, in the 80s they they said, you know, you, should, you shouldn't use calculators because we wouldn't know how to work mathematics. Eventually, it became acceptable. The same thing with generative AI. It's a tool that needs to be um, embraced and integrated as part of our processes, whatever we are doing. Um, do we use it to copy every? No, we need to use it where we need to use it to do research, to, do, to give us ideas, to give us a framework, and then employ it within our thought process. Okay, so obviously I am against plagiarism, copying something and um, claiming it to be mine when it is not mine. So obviously um, it will help me as, as, as search engines helped me in the past. Um, now instead of using a search engine of, and of Googling a number of times, I use a generative AI model or a system and to do the same thing. Okay, so obviously as if you haven't plagiarized before, you don't need to plagiarize now either. So let me go back to my presentation, which is this one. Um, and 
talking about generative AI, which I wanted to introduce in this very short video, giving you the basic ideas. It also showed you some AI and the neural nets and the hidden layers, which I'm glad. But obviously, it's this this new era in AI is taking empowerment, which is what we're talking about today, to the next level, not just for educators, but also for education leaders, because it allows us to, to dream, as you can see in these four images I found online, um, in, this, in this case, I was Googling for, to find them, but it, it represents very nicely how such, such a tool can assist us. So previously, maybe two, three years, we, we used to talk, use this app, like I'm using, for example, this app to, to, to um, have you participate in my lecture, but also now we're using other apps or other tools like um, ChatGPT to empower us to the next level. As you can see, it can help us to think, as I said, like brainstorming, research analysis, asking questions, even to design this presentation, for example. Um, so I wanted to, to be sure that I include all that I need to say and not miss anything. I asked um, Perplexity, which is another generative AI tool like ChatGPT, to recommend what would be the structure if it had to present um, a one hour presentation, I can specify the time, a one hour presentation of empowering education through AI, for example. And then I make sure that my slides, that I am doing my own slides, I will include all the points, not to miss out anything. Obviously, you can do it to lighten your load. So for the sending communication or drafting and drafting some documents. So for example, I have colleagues who used it to resign from work. What, what I'm going to design? They ask Matthew, can you give me a template of, of a res resignation letter? Because I can't find one on Google. Ask, ask Generative AI. It will create it and put in your own um, touch, your own style, your own name, obviously, and send it over. So the idea is use the tool, adjust it, adapt it, and adopt it as your own, because then you changed it, and then obviously you can use it. You can use it to review, to proofread materials, to um, um, concise a paragraph, for example. So it's it's very good in those in those um, in those ways. It's generating. It's not creating from scratch. Keep this in mind. This AI technology is generating from all the data it's been fed. One academic told me, but why don't you still use Google um, to do to do your research? And the answer was simple because what um, a generative AI can do in two minutes when I when I prompt it with a question, it will take me five to 10 years to look at all those websites that it's looked at and it used to retrain it. So this is the reason because it has such access. That's why it's called a large language model LLM because it has access to all this data and that has been used to train it so that it can um, figure out what to generate when you ask it or when you prompt it to give you an answer. It's trying to predict what the next word and the next word and the next word will be, and it will create a whole thing. Same with images, same with the video, and same with audio. It can generate all this in a multimodal way, so it's incredible as well. It can also obviously, as you can see in the third one, design, build your own content, create slides, um, course materials, um, assessments, uh, images, videos, prompts, and the, the way it works. Again, I don't want to go too much through it. It's 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 a session in, in its own right, which, which we're all excited about. And as I said, it should be an X course you attend. And some of them are already available online as well. But it is one way that you go into a session as if you're querying, as if you're the director of a movie and you're proposing and you're prompting your actors what to do. That's how it works. And finally, it can be used um, to advance your work so for development, for example, developing strategic plans, project plans, um, scripting, coding, queries, tables, Excel formulas, statistic performances, like standard deviations. It will do all this because having been given so many, much of these thousands and millions of data that has been fed, um, that are available online, obviously. Now it can predict um, what the next word, what the next um, production can be through its generation. So um, moving on from generative AI, um, 
as I said, the main issue is how can we assess our students who have access to it? Don't you think that university students only? Um, my nephew, who is 12 year old and 13 year olds, um, have access to it on the phones. They use it for their homework. And obviously, some teachers in secondary school have no idea what's happening yet, let alone academics. So at all levels, this is being, being used. So what I showed my own academics at the university, I went on, look, we're trying to assess the deep, higher levels of cognition. We're not trying to look at the remembering, the low level surface learning by giving them to duplicate, to, to replicate a formula, for example. In fact, we give students formulas in our exams so that can, they can use the thought process to apply those processes. So why do we, why do we have to exam students? In my opinion, exams should be banned completely and we assess our students along the process of the educational process. So instead of doing an exam, which is a summative thing, we do a formative thing as we go along. And I do this with my students, trying to obviously ensure that it, it's there. Um, I'm assessing their knowledge or their thought process. One of them, when I do, for example, when I'm teaching um, programming, I go to the, to, to the class, um, something I've learned when I was in the States, and I do a short quiz. Give them a piece of paper. I tell them, I'm giving you a quiz for a two minute quiz. Write a piece of code to sort a list, for example. And they do it there and then. I know they're doing it there in front of me. It takes them two minutes, pick it up, and off we go and continue with the lecture. And in this way, I'm sure that it's their thought process. I don't even ask them to write code sometimes, even the process as they go through it. Because industry out there, our own students come back to us, tell us, you know, we don't write programs anymore. We use generative AI to create programs. So we're preparing our students for the industry out there. So useless trying to teach them how to program line by line. So what they do, they generate the code. And then, as I said, they adapt it and adopt it for their own use and obviously um, make it theirs. So this is Bloom's um, taxonomy, as you might have um, realized. It's, it's done for assessment and it's done to uh, identify and think a bit about what we want to assess our students, even with such a powerful tool as AI that is helping not just students, not just students and educators, but even education leaders in their work. A short activity, so you can go back to this to the um, to the slide that I showed you, which is the next one. I'm going to stop the poll and going to start another one so we can access the same. Um, the same barcode. Not barcode, sorry, the same 3D 3D. Um, sign over here, slido.com, the same number, and I'm going to share the output. Most probably some of you started doing it already. So let me find if it's this one, it's this one. And you are asked to rank these five statements rank the following AI driven tools based on their potential to empower education leaders. What do you think is the most important um, tool out of these? Let me start from the bottom. Virtual simulation for scenario playing like um, avatars, for example. And you can see that people are already pushing in Is it predictive analytics for student enrollment? Is it decision support systems for resource allocation, which classroom, which screen and budget planning? Is it data driven insights for strategic planning and policy for formulation? So this is much more targeted towards education leaders. Um, and you can see this as people are ranking them up, you can see this in real time happening um what what you guys are voting and ranking on your own screens it looks like the data driven insights sort of the the analytics that is happening at the back of the system to strategical plan like like it's it's so, sort of a, a decision support system as well and policy formation so obviously very interesting to see 
I'll give it a couple of more minutes and switch. Especially if number one is keeping up strongly. So yes, I think the data driven insights is what the majority consider to be um, the most potential or powerful AI driven tool to empower education leaders. Good. Another part where you could interact. Um, what's interesting also about it is the fact that um, some of these issues, like, predict, like number four, predictive analytics for student enrollment and retention. So actually, we're going to use AI to see which students will allow to enroll. I put these topics specifically also to not to tease, but to help you um, appreciate that AI could be um, touchy in some points, you know, the ethics of AI. Do we use AI to help us distinguish one student from another? So how accurate is AI? So this is the next topic I'll be talking about, which is the third topic for today's session, which is um, around, um, and off we go, which is about ethics. So I have my third video coming up now. Um, I'm going to stop and share the third video. Again, a two minute video, not to waste time. And off we go, AM education. This one is two minutes. The term artificial intelligence or AI can seem so futuristic and mystifying. But what if I told you it's already part of our daily lives? No matter where we are in life, AI has impacted our daily lives from automated customer interactions improved personalized shopping experiences and operational automation. AI can be implemented seamlessly to improve our way of living. AI has proven to streamline businesses, client experience, boosting productivity, and thus increasing revenue. Whilst all this talk about AI may seem new and exciting, it also raises a concern regarding its ethics. If AI is not deployed properly, it could cause harm, damage reputation, or contain legal risks. Technology itself is neutral, and it is important for people and organizations to understand and be accountable to the risks involved in AI application and implementation. The development of AI must be human-centric, with fair outcomes, ultimately aiming to enhance our quality of life. It must also be transparent and explainable where the purpose of the AI program is clearly stated and easy for users to understand. Thus, professionals in AI ethics have built a comprehensive authoritative book called The Body of Knowledge, or BOK. It aims to serve as a guide that defines what is considered ethical implementation in the field of AI technology. Ultimately, AI, as with any tool or entity, when used reliably and honestly, can help improve our lives while building a dependable platform for which we as a society can build our future upon. That is why it is important that we focus on understanding AI ethics and implementing it in a principled manner. So yeah, for sure, you know, the EU is very much active in, the, in this regard. And it's obviously, um, as you can see also in my next slide, um, the, the famous EU AI Act, which was um, out this January and which regulates the use of AI within society, but it also focuses on the use of AI um, within, within education as well. So it's an important act, the first of its kind around the world, and obviously all European countries, including Malta, will have to abide to this AI Act. Also on the bottom left, you see this document, which is the ethical guidelines on the use of artificial intelligence and data in teaching and learning for educators. It's um, it's um, a book, um, a leaflet actually, a paper about the use and ethics of, of data, which I was part of the team of experts who created this document. And it's also available. So if you want 
copies of this, I can send you PDFs of this of this thing as well. So yes, this third part in these last ten minutes is about the challenges and ethical considerations, and I wanted to be I wanted it to be here because it's very important from an educator and also from an education leader point of view. The fact that we need to be accountable, especially with children, let's say school children, okay, teenagers who are more vulnerable than, than adults at university who can give consent. Obviously, there could there are ethical and also legal consequences. But of, obviously, um, there is the issue of security. You know, I mentioned the learner profile, but who has access to the learner profile? What if I use the learner profile to sell products? Is that allowed? Is the learner allowing this to happen without even realizing we're allowing it as we use the social media? I'm sure you realize that as soon as you mention something, as soon as you search for something, automatically the social media, whichever one you use, will bombard you to sell that kind of thing. So obviously that is one very important issue. Another issue is bias, and this is another ethical consideration. Since the large language models, the generative AI I was talking about, is being trained, is using large amounts of data, and the data itself is biased, for example, let's say, um, Literally, if I look for images um, of managers or IT managers, automatically white males come up for no reason, which I cannot explain. The only reason I can explain because it's being trained that way with the data. If I look for nurses, usually it's women. If I look for cleaners, usually it's women. So this bias is inherent within the data. And if we use that data to train our models, the AI system has nothing more else to do than to replicate what's been inputted, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, literally from something that you might remember from your school days. So this is a very important um, issue um, with, with bias, especially if you're, using, you're doing user testing and you're not representing all ethnicities in your user model. So it's, it's a problem. For example, there's a movie um, on Netflix at the moment, it's called Coded Bias. Coded Bias is a very good explanation. It's a, an hour and a half movie, docu, docu, documentary about this American student who found a piece of software, which is AI for face recognition, which was trained with biased data. And it couldn't recognize her because she's a woman and she was colored. So it couldn't recognize it because the system was trained within the Silicon Valley with white males, for example. So the system didn't know. But it's a very interesting documentary, which I recommend you can see. Another issue, maybe I'll just pick up on three, is the transparency issue. I want to know why the AI system decided to do, to give me this reply, for example. So we use the term of explainable AI. Explainable AI itself, again, a topic that we can spend another hour speaking about explainable AI is part, in my opinion, of the future because it allows us to trust the system. You know, it decided this way, and I'm gonna tell you all the steps of how I reached my conclusions. The system can explain as it went through the process to explain each step, why I recommend that you do this test or why I recommend this book. In fact, Netflix explains why it recommends a movie because it says, since you watch this movie, or these three types of movie, it turns out that you like crime movies. So it puts you into a cluster, which is an AI model called clustering. In the AI, in the cluster of all those people, or all those million of millions of people who watch crime movies, and since they watch another movie that you didn't watch, it will recommend it to you. So that's how clustering works, for example. But also there are legal ramifications. So the EU AI Act is taking care of this. For example, one um, article in the UI Act specifies that you cannot use image or face recognition within the classroom to figure out how students are feeling. You cannot use this in the classroom unless they give consent, like at the university. But in classrooms where there are young students, especially under 16 years of age, you cannot use this kind of thing. That in China, obviously not in the EU, in the States, in UK, they might be using already. For sure, I, I heard about a case where um, police are using face recognition on the Oxford Street in London to identify potential um, criminals. You know, 
it, it is a v massive ethical thing. They use it in airports. And when you go into specific countries, for example, and it identifies a person that could be um, involved in criminal activity due to the recognition of the face. So imagine if the data that's been trained, the AI system has been trained, looks much like you, where you're innocent, you're being stopped for questioning. I'm not going to say you're going to be arrested, but obviously there is this bias in the data that obviously we need to be accountable for. Another final example is um, self-driven cars, for example. What if a car is driving on its own and it hits a person on the street? Who is accountable for this? Why didn't the system work fine? So this is another issue. A final short activity. I know there are four minutes left, but you can go back to your um, screen where you had, and I'm going to issue the last, the last one for today, and it's about Ticking, you can start it off because it started, and I'm going to share the screen. And it says, which application do you think possesses the greatest ethical challenge in education? So you can see people already voting, starting to vote. Feel free to vote. So the choices are predictive analytics for student performance. Is that ethical? Automated grading that the system starts to assess students and gives feedback. Personalized learning algorithms customized to the students. Virtual assistants like avatars or anything else. I can see that the predictive analytics for student performance is quite strong. Keep on voting. We'll keep it going. I'll give it a minute and then I'll do my closure in two minutes. Very interesting. Automated grading, personalized learning, and it seems that more than half the class think that predictive analytics, predicting what a, a student might potentially do and perform, the system, the AI system is, do, is doing this, might pose the greatest ethical challenge. 62%, quite strong. Great. Actually, I'll be using these statistics um, uh, in my own research, so you can keep on voting as we go along. Okay, it's two minutes left, so I'm going to close now. I'm going to share my presentation again and move on. To the closing slide highlighting basically the three areas that we've covered during the session we have covered the, the basic artificial intelligence what it does and um, around this graphic i found on, on, while googling it's not my graphic and um, we can do planning we can do perception national language processing machine learning robotics neural networks and that's AI in a nutshell i also mentioned generative ai which can generate content images, text, audio, video, based on the data it finds online, the masses of data. We also spoke about applications of AI in the education sector. Very interesting. Grading systems, smart content, voice assistant, personalized learning is something I highlighted because it's my main research area. Real-time assessment, AI-based tutoring, and finally closed at the bottom right with the ethical considerations, um, keeping the humans in the loop, within an educational system perspective. Um, at the center, we have the students and the teachers, and you can see privacy and data security, um, minimizing bias, context awareness, aligned to our vision for e-learning, transparent, accountable, inspectable, explainable, overridable AI. So these are the main concepts um, that we went through today. If you have any questions, um, please feel free. I know there are a lot of people. I know it's five o'clock as well. Um, but that was my my timing. So let me see. Hi, Marilyn, I can see you now. Thank you very much, Matthew. Yes, I was uh, staying on the background. The floor was yours. Uh, basically, it's five o'clock, but uh, I think we can uh, maybe still one, two minutes because we had a very interesting, interesting question in the chat. 
so a participant asked that uh, this lecture is truly fascinating and valuable to me and I'm highly motivated and I'm a highly motivated student teacher from Georgia. I have a question. How can I integrate AI into the subject curriculum? And to what extent extent can I utilize artificial intelligence in the elementary classroom? Uh, in our country, parents are opposed to using AI because they fear it may lead to addiction and a decline in the quality of education. Uh, what is your thought on that, on this, on this very last well, question? My, my immediate thought, first of all, is to involve the, involve the parents in the process. That's the one way to win them over. But what if I told the parents so that they don't get addicted? Don't give them papers, don't give them pens, pencils, because you know, my father used to go to school with, with, a, with a piece of board and no, no, no paper. So obviously, it, that is a tool. The pencil is a tool, the calculator is a tool, the book is a tool, and AI is another tool. If they're not going to integrate it in the school, in the class, and there are plenty of ways, and the best way to do it. I tell this person from Georgia is to look online for the resources that are free so you don't have to pay anything they're free they're intuitive and you can include if they don't include them they're missing out you know I mentioned who is AI literate let alone IT literate okay my 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 father who's a 90 year old is not IT literate and he misses out so our own children will miss out for the future future jobs so as I said in my opening slide, yes, AI won't replace you. People who know how to use AI will replace you. So that's a good reason. I also put my email address in the chat for those who want to um, email me. I can send some of the textbooks if they if they need them, you know. I can send them to Maria Elena if you want and distribute them. And even the presentation, Maria Elena, is, is available for free. You know, it's we will debate. share. We'll share the presentation with all the participants uh, in the webinars uh, page on the European School Education platform. My colleague Marta has shared all the links with you. Uh, she has also shared uh, an, a feedback form, which we kindly invite you to fill in, uh, and uh, this will um, this will help us uh, get better in the yes. future for our future webinars. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Matthew. I don't know if you were hearing Marilena during the, during the presentation, yes. but I was recommending yes. that the European School Education Platform will go for the next thing. It doesn't have to be me, it could be anybody else, but it's generative AI that people want to use nowadays. And it's a very um, recent topic that needs to be spoken about. Well, uh, we're trying, our developers basically, they try to uh, keep keep improving the platform. Since it's a very new platform, it was introduced only uh, one and a half year ago almost. Okay. So yeah, we're still working on that and we're trying to make it even better. Uh, but thank you very much. So um, here you can see some uh, upcoming online courses on the European School Education Platform. Please feel free to navigate. Uh, you will see a new environment, a new home page. We hope that you like this uh, this setting uh, in there, and uh, maybe it has it will facilitate uh, the user's experience. Uh, well, I think we should conclude. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much, Matthew, uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation and very interactive. I have to admit. Um, so, uh, thank you everyone once again. Uh, you will find the recording on uh, the European School Education Platform YouTube along uh, with the presentation. And see you in, a, in another webinar. Have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. You too. Ciao. Bye-bye.